This is Audio Immunity, a podcast about our body's never-ending fight with the outside world. Today, we're talking about killer T cells. If you're a virologist, the killer cell, you're like, it's the cell that kills the stuff, as opposed to the cell that helps things kill the stuff. And we're talking about what happens when those cells get so exhausted they can't fight. T cells are constantly being activated. They're constantly trying to kill the infected cells, but they're just not able to clear out the infection. And in that case, you need some other regulatory mechanism to turn off the immune system because if you haven't cleared a viral infection after a couple months, you're not clearing it. Finally, we'll talk about exactly why T cells get exhausted and how new research could help lead to treatments for chronic viral infections as well as cancer. Whereas before they were just sitting around seeing these virally infected cells and saying, eh, but I'm really tired. <laughs> now they're super activated. Hi, this is Audio Immunity, Episode 7. I'm Kevin Bonham, and joining me today are Matt Woodruff. Hey, everybody. And Kate France. Hello. It's so, France, not oh, France. Go ahead. Kate what France. What did I say? Kate <laughs> France. I think, you, I think you said France, or or else it just came mm. in my headphones. Funny. Should we, when we do the introduction, should we say like more about ourselves? Or, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, we have the intro episode, and people can find out who we are, and maybe just every yeah. once in a while, we'll just push it in there, and then see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Sounds I don't good. think we really need um, to go through our. I mean, the weather. Every time. The weather is the same for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that is true. We could do like our our individual microclimates, but uh, that would get boring. With I mean, it could thing. be. I could also ask what Kate's drinking, because usually Kate's drinking something, and I'm also drinking something usually. And so we could just mm. open with something along those lines. To Start being really clearly alcoholics. I yeah. like this plan. <laughs> Today, yeah, um... Today's talk is brought to you by Red Stripe, Jamaican-style <laughs> lager. <laughs> Maybe we'll get some sponsors. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Can you imagine I if like we it, were actually. sponsored by an alcohol? Yes, I can I imagine really it. Like that I, idea. I, dream I could about really it. imagine that. <laughs> so let's let's do this. Hi everybody, welcome to Audio Immunity, episode seven. I'm Kevin Bonham, and joining me is Matt Woodruff. Hey everybody. Today Matt is drinking. What are you drinking, Matt? Uh, doers today. It's usually it's usually doers unless I switch it up, but does that this... does often happen. So I'll keep you updated. Okay, sounds great. And also joining me today, graduate student in virology, Kate Franz, not Kate France. Hey, hey guys. And Kate, what are you drinking today? Today I'm drinking Red Stripe Jamaican style lager, and that I just tasty. I did a little freeze frame. Yeah, it was good. It but was good for everyone that can't see the for video For everyone who feed. can't see. Yeah, and, uh, it would have made everyone a good commercial. Because this vid- these videos aren't recorded. Right, but I mean, they can imagine. I realize that a lot of the beer I drink is just stolen from Micro Happy Hour. Because <laughs> I, was, I was like, Why I... Why would it not be? Because I had a selection of like seven beers in my refrigerator today, <laughs> and I realized I mean, it was a good haul if, last Friday. Good haul. If you, don't, if you don't have stolen booze from a happy hour, then you're doing grad school wrong. That's good point (laughs) apparently i did grad school wrong and yet i still have my phd shut up kevin (laughs) shut up kevin you're my new supplier kevin has become obnoxious about his phd dr bonham has become insufferable yeah did you say he like really emphasized graduate student kate graduate yeah Yeah. no that was that was definitely intentional and matt what you need to realize is that i've always been insufferable (laughs) it's just that you're now noticing because it used to be but you never had this specific thing to hold over my head before right precisely yeah we were always insufferable in the exact same way and now i'm better than you Uh, Kevin, I just think you're out of touch. You've lost touch with the graduate student community. Mm, I'm sure that's true. Right. In any case, today we are going to be talking about CD8 T cells, also known as cytotoxic T lymphocytes, or CTLs, and that special way in which they screw up, or we perceive it as screwing up anyway. Or if you're a virologist, the killer cell, you're like, it's the cell that kills the stuff, as opposed to the cell that helps things kill the stuff. That is actually, that was exactly my understanding of it coming into grad school (laughs) in immunology. And it almost continues to be that way. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, that's that's pretty much still my understanding of it uh, to this day. So the way to start, I think, thinking about CD8, cytotoxic T cells is we've talked about antibodies before as these proteins that are made by B cells and they're able to bind to stuff 
like virus particles or toxins and neutralize them and get rid of them, cause them to be eaten, all kinds of things like this. So those are antibodies produced by B cells. The trouble with that as a strategy, I mean, it's a great strategy in general, but one of the limitations of antibodies is that many pathogens are intracellular pathogens. So they live inside of cells. All viruses, many bacteria live on the inside of our own cells. And there's a membrane barrier that's good for a cell to keep stuff out, generally speaking, but it does, it also keeps antibodies out. So if we want to get to viruses that are inside cells, we need some other mechanism. Now, antibodies are capable of detecting sometimes things that are inside of cells. So for instance, if a virus makes some protein that is then expressed on the cell surface, surface, there might be an antibody that's capable of binding to that protein on the cell surface, and then some other cell can come recognize that an antibody is bound to our own cells and kill it. That's something called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, or ADCC. But that mechanism isn't super efficient if viruses aren't producing proteins on the cell surface, or not very many. They're still going to be hidden. Also, if you sort of imagine as a virus is producing new viral particles, there's sort of going to be a cloud of virus particles around that infected cell, and the antibodies aren't going to be able to discriminate. They're going to see the virus particle on the outside of the cell, bind it up, and never actually make it to the cell that's infected. So as a result, the immune system has evolved a way of actually peering inside of cells and looking at what's going on inside. I just wanted to point out that we actually got an email about this uh, not two days ago. Someone asked exactly this question. So I wanted to uh, give a shout out to Jesse Knorr. I hope I'm saying your name correctly from Bacteriophiles, which... Uh, it is another podcast. But I just wanted to point out that he he asked some really good questions by email and hopefully we answered some of those questions and i'd love to encourage people with questions to do that because we are actually much more likely to talk about these things if people specifically ask for them so thanks Jesse, right. we, for reaching out we had planned this episode before we got jesse's email and it was just a happy coincidence but actually i think so don't it would feel be a good special idea to jesse read... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are not special. I think we should maybe read emails out because I think the discussion, I mean, we, we answered him via email, but I think the answers that we gave would be useful for other listeners as well, potentially. So maybe we'll do yeah, that I at agree. the end of the podcast. But yeah, so Jesse Knorr, who does the Bacteria Files, that's uh, Bacterio and then F-I-L-E-S. I love um, that title, his by podcast the way. Name, love, it's good. His podcast name is it's almost really as punny as ours is. <laughs> I still um, like audio immunity. Let me throw well, that out there, but you know, I I can we can like both. I think that's fine. Yeah, um, but I listen to I'm I listen not to willing one to give away Punny's name. I'm not willing <laughs> to give it away. So I did listen to one of one of his podcasts. Um, it's actually part of the ASM network of podcasts, and at least the episode I listened to was pretty short. It was like eight minutes long, and he just sort of went through a paper, gave a little introduction, went through the data pretty concisely, and it was really good. So cool. if you like our podcast and want something a little more more quick <laughs> not quite as long and involved as ours and probably about bacteria, less, go less filled with what we're drinking <laughs> right so in any case so we've established that we want to be able to peer inside cells and we need a way to do this and the way that we do this actually involves something that we've talked about before and that is the mhc protein the major histocompatibility complex proteins and if you remember back from episode one was it that far i back? think it was episode um, one yeah, yeah i think it was too. Yeah. where we talked about transplantation we, we talked about podcast <laughs> yeah because we're so old now at, yeah at we're super seven. old yeah. at seven <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're almost... only five away from vincent rack and yellow's magic numbers so i know right i was just about to, to say that, that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> It's like one season. MHCs, um, flagpoles. Yeah, MHCs. So we, t we describe these as sort of flagpoles and flags. So our immune system is capable of recognizing the flagpoles as self and then also flags that are mounted to those flagpoles to get some sense of what's going on inside the cell. So if cells aren't expressing the flagpole, there are special cells that say, hey, there's something wrong here. That cell may be infected. Something might be screwing with its ability to signal. But the main function of MHC is to present present small parts of proteins on the cell surface. So the way this works is that during the regular course of a cell's life, it's constantly making proteins and it's constantly turning those proteins over by degrading them, breaking them down into smaller pieces and recycling them. But some of those proteins, as proteins are being degraded, are presented on the cell surface in this MHC protein. So these are small peptides for MHC1. I think it's like between seven and nine, if I'm wrong. Uh, yes. Yep. 
uh, MHC eleven, two. eleven. Sorry, nine and eleven. I believe. Let me that's, check that. That's MHC one. Because there's so there's yeah. two different types of MHC. We're gonna sort of ignore MHC two for now. But MHC class one is presenting peptides on the cell surface that are based on proteins that were expressed inside of the cell. So there's a mechanism by which cytoplasmic proteins are pumped into vesicles containing MHC class one, and those MHC class one molecules loaded with peptide are then sent to the cell surface and displayed for any T cell to wander by and take a look at. And this is every cell in the body. I just want to point out this isn't just immune cells that we're talking about. Every cell in your body has the potential to be infected by something like a virus. And so what you want is you want an immune system that's constantly able to assess every single cell in your body. And if it sees one of these 8 to 10 amino acid little chains in an MHC and it looks like a virus, right, you want your immune system to be able to see everything. And to answer your previous question, we could have actually split the difference. It's 8 to 10 amino acids in length. Perfect. Did you look at MHC2? Uh, I think that's a little bit longer. It is longer. And yeah, and more importantly, the uh, the binding grooves in it's MHC2, open. yeah, they're open. So what you can right. have is you can have the center of the peptide sort of stuck in the MHC molecule and then sort of these floppy bits on the outside. Right. So you can sort of think of a hot dog bun. And MHC class one is a hot dog bun where the ends are sealed off and the hot dog sitting in the I middle hate is sort those of closed. Hot dog buns. I hate them. <laughs> I, the split why top? would you I ever? Like no, yeah, but the ones is that a where real it's thing? hard. Yeah, sometimes they don't cut them all the way and you just have like, it's really frustrating. Matt hates like, MHC class one. I feel one like there's some sort of buns. joke to be made about hot dogs and hot dog buns, but I'm just going to leave it. I'm just gonna, I think you just made it. I'm just going to let it lie. I'm just going to let it lie. Okay. Don't worry about it. All right. I'll I'm so confused. <laughs> <laughs> so, in any case, we're gonna get healthy an explicit cells. tag. <laughs> eh. Uh oh, that's me. No, no, it's not me. Oh. It's Kevin. Kevin died. Kevin's dead. <laughs> Kevin's dead. This does happen at least twice an episode. We're gonna have to here at Audio Immunity. We're raising funds for Kevin <laughs> to get some goddamn internet. Does he have RCN or something? I don't know. No, he has Comcast. <laughs> Is he back? Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, we just announced a fundraiser through Audio Immunity to buy you some goddamn internet. That would be phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> I really need to start I really need to start recording this from my office where I have a hard line built in. Um in Probably any case. Bad idea. Hot dog buns, hard lines, whatever. Hot dog buns, hard lines, floppy bits. So that is the every... title. That's the title. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me mark that in my audio mm-hmm. so we have it. Um <laughs> Anyway, so every cell in the body is, whether it's infected or not, healthy or not, is constantly taking bits of cytoplasmic proteins, chewing them up, and displaying them on MHC class 1 on the cell surface. And T cells are going by looking at those cells and trying to assess if they are foreign. And the way they do that is sort of similar to the way that we talked about previously that B cells have specific receptors to particular antigens. So B cells chop up and rearrange their genomes, make these unique receptors that then can potentially bind to anything in the universe. And then the ones that bind to things we don't want them to bind to, like our own proteins, are typically deleted. T cells go through a very similar process. Their receptors are actually related to B cell receptors. They're they're immunoglobulin fold containing proteins. They look very much like an antibody. They're dimers. And they have that same VDJ recombination that B cells have to make their randomized receptor. Instead of T cells being able to bind anything like a B cell, T cell receptors are trained in an organ called the thymus that we may have mentioned before peripherally in the context of MHC, but T cells are trained in the thymus to only survive if they recognize something in the context of an MHC molecule. So you never have a T cell that can just bind to sort of a free molecule, uh, at least not in nature. There's actually experimentally, you can tweak T cells in such a way that they can make randomized receptors that'll bind to anything. In a normal mouse under, or human under normal circumstances, T T cells that can't bind to anything in the context of MHC are going to get deleted. And then those that bind also really strongly to self-peptide in MHC are also deleted. So you have both positive selection for T cells that bind something in the context of MHC, but then negative selection to remove those T cells that recognize self 
in the context of MHC. Are you guys happy with that explanation? Yeah, no, I like it. I like it. I think it's interesting. Um, so sometimes you get these things called super antigens. This is correct, right? They do occur in nature. And the purpose of those is to trick the T cell into seeing something that it thinks is specific. Yeah, so those are, those are usually, I think, often bacterial. Yeah. I'm not sure if they're viral examples of of super antigens there probably are but, but i know mostly bacteria to do that yeah yeah so, so we, they oh, go ahead so if you sort of imagine the the hot dog bun with the hot dog peptide on the inside and then the t-cell receptor comes over the top and can detect the bun and the hot dog and that binding you it usually requires binding to both the bun and the hot dog in order to get a response is my mouth the t-cell T-cell receptor in this case because i'm getting really hungry <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because your mouth, generally speaking, the way Do most eat people a hot eat hot dog dogs, like that, right. you just, like, <laughs> eat it, no. eat it, hot dog first. You can't, you can't see bun. Matt's thing, but just, this is like, what I was just trying to describe. Smash it into your face. <laughs> T cell receptors do not come at the side. Well, okay, so let's think about it this way. A hot dog bun with a hot dog on top of a pedestal, and you can't pick up the hot dog bun. You have to just, like, lean over it like you're in a hot dog eating contest without use of your hands and chomp on the the hot dog. Right, the middle. The middle part of it. That's how T cell receptors bind. And that absolutely wins... (laughs) It it beats flagpole. We're done. Now we're different different kinds of hot dogs. No matter you know what this means. Hot dogs is we have like to, their hamburgers. <laughs> we have to. How do you eat? How do? You, <laughs> what? That makes like, no sense. I was sense. thinking like you take the hot dog, you flip it like bun meat uh, bun, and then eat it like a hamburger. Like that's that's basic. I wouldn't I like. See. It's like a oh, I see. section of the hamburger. Yeah, I get it, yeah. Matt. Matt, you know we have to somehow make an illustrator cartoon yeah. that depicts this with hot yeah. dogs we got it yeah. i like want to do it'll happen yeah it'll happen so super antigens are th- super antigens are binding so in this in this analogy where your mouth is the t-cell receptor you are coming down over the top of the hot dog the a super antigen essentially binds to the pedestal that the hot dog is on as well as your face and holds them together For a so long regardless time. So if that if that hot dog is nasty, you still can't pull your face away. You're still bound to the hot dog because the super antigen is holding your face next to the hot dog. That's how super antigens work. Okay. I don't know why you brought them up, but also aren't super well, antigens I, a, I, it, they're a MHC thing. two thing because they are the open flappy bits, like because they. <laughs> The MHC two allows for flappy bits. Super antigens aren't aren't on MHC ones, are they? I, I yeah, don't know. I, actually I think don't they know. are. Well, anyway, in any case, I'm, I'm we may be full we, of I'm we may be full of crap because that that allowed us to build out the metaphor. Now we've yeah, got well, hot dogs on pedestals. The unfortunate thing is is like cars smashing into medians on a highway. Um, if we're totally wrong about the way we described this, I'm not going to be able to cut it out. So, so we're just going to have to include it and be wrong. Here's the thing. I just Googled a PLOS biology paper called mm-hmm. Clarifying the Mechanism of Super Antigen Toxicity. And the first sentence is, super antigens are bacterial proteins that generate a powerful immune response by binding to MHC class 2 molecules. God damn it. <laughs> well. <laughs> Uh, I vote that we leave that whole thing in. <laughs> We're gonna. We have to. <laughs> like, right. Sorry, everyone, that we didn't know what a super antigen exactly was. We were sort of close. Charles we is sorry to be, that. Sorry Charles to is that gonna be commenter. pissed. He doesn't like I, when we sure say that... things and then say, never mind, scratch that, start from the beginning. <laughs> who, who who doesn't like that? A postdoc in my lab. He listens oh. to our podcast. He said that you, some episode, you and Kevin like spoke a lot about some topic and then you're like, actually, we're completely wrong about this. Yeah, the we reason that. that we had to do that was because the conversation had gotten so far past that mistake that we we couldn't actually edit it. We would have had to completely re-record the episode, so I apologize to the postdoc in the cave in the lab that uh that did not appreciate that i also apologize to my mother who said that oh when you're doing things you should probably look them up before you say them otherwise you sound like you don't know what you're talking about and i'm sorry mom but it turns out that sometimes we just don't know what we're talking about and yeah. i'm okay with that yep in any case i don't even know why we brought up super antigen in the first place. i think well, we can cut out is. super antigen to be perfectly honest i think we can we're, cut it out I we're gonna think. find out we're gonna find out but i do like That's the face whole... hot dog metaphor yeah if we if we lose if we lose the face hot dog thing it's gonna no we're we're leaving it in but we're gonna move on so all cells are presenting peptides 
peptide MHC on their cell surface at all times. But the benefit of this is that because it's a normal cellular function and T cells that see self-peptide in MHC get deleted, what that means is that T cells that see that bind really strongly to a peptide in an MHC can be pretty sure that they see an infected cell. Now, most of the time, T cells are also activated in the presence of other activating signals like pattern recognition receptor signals that we've talked about in previous episodes. But for the purposes of this podcast, just sort of think about a T cell that sees a non-self peptide in MHC can be pretty sure that there's something wrong inside the cell that it is capable of binding to. Well, let's put it in a in a little tiny bit of context then, just because I, I do think that that concept can be confusing. So we've talked about how B cells need to become activated in order to start producing antibodies. And that happens in local lymph nodes, germinal center responses. We've talked a little bit about that in previous podcasts. T cells obviously also have to be activated before they can perform what's called their effector function. And we've got a little diagram of effector T cells. I'm pretty sure there's a Rastafarian T cell in that. And I keep plugging that just because that's the favorite, my favorite character that I've ever made. But the T cells that we're talking about, the CD8 T cells that are going to be capable of killing an infected cell, they have already seen their antigen in the lymph node. Some sort of antigen presenting cell, like a dendritic cell, has already shown them this peptide before. And so they know what they're looking for. And they've seen that, as Kevin mentioned, in the context of danger. So that dendritic cell has basically told them, previous to what we're talking about now, there are infected cells out there, and those infected cells are something to be worried about. So the T cell packs its bags, gets out of the lymph node, goes goes through the homing process, which I believe we described as slamming into the slamming into the barrier a couple episodes ago, but go through a homing process where they find an infected tissue, and now all of a sudden they see a tissue that has the correct peptide. It's the same peptide that the dendritic cell showed them all the way back at the lymph node. So Right, they, and now they, they know that that peptide, any cell that has that peptide on the in its MHC must be infected with the thing that contains that peptide that is dangerous. Right. So so in practice, what this means is if a virus infects, say, an airway epithelial cell, so one of the cells lining your airway, that infection is going to trigger an immune response. A dendritic cell is going to carry that virus into the lymph node to activate the T cell and through a process called cross-presentation that's too complicated to get into, I barely understand it myself, they basically educate the T-cells to the presence of that virus, and then that T-cell goes back to the infected tissue. Any airway epithelial cell now that has that peptide in MHC, that T-cell knows that cell must be infected with that virus, and so I need to kill it. And the way that T-cells, these cytotoxic T-cells, kill is actually not like they, they don't stab the cell through the heart. What they do is they hand the cell a knife and basically tell it to commit suicide. It's so, very noble. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's cells, the cells apoptosis. of your body, right, exactly. The cells of your body are happy to die. So what these CD8 T cells do when they recognize a cell that expresses MHC with this foreign peptide is they shoot out two molecules called perforin and granzyme. And essentially through mechanisms that are complicated we won't go into, basically they convince that infected cell to commit suicide. They force that cell to enter apoptosis and die. Yeah, and it's and it's a hard convincing, right? It's they they don't really like give Oh, they the don't cell... leave them a choice. Yeah, no. there's there's not much room for interpretation as to the signals here. It's it's sort of a right. it's sort of a mob like thing. Like you really yeah, so the... should should kill yourself. It's for the <laughs> yeah, better it's... it's for the betterment of the family. <laughs> <laughs> no? Too much? No, I, no, I think that's yeah. I think that's right. So that's how T cells work in in the best context. So in the case of say the flu or a cold virus like rhinovirus, you get an infection. Your macrophages and dendritic cells at the site of infection induce inflammation. DC runs off to the lymph node, activates some T cells. Those T cells come back to the tissue, kill all the infected cells. Maybe some antibodies mop up the viral particles that are left, and then the infection is cleared. So that's great when it works out that way, and that usually 
usually takes in order to get the t-cell and b-cell responses going that usually takes a week the symptoms of those sorts of infections are the runny nose and the fever and things like that those are all consequences of your immune response and it takes a little while to resolve but it does resolve because the infection gets cleared there are no longer activating signals all of these systems have in place built-in negative regulatory mechanisms to sort of back off the immune response once there's no more activating signal and they do that because inflammation, if it's sustained for a long period of time, is really damaging to tissues. The trouble that we're going to be talking about today comes in basically when that virus doesn't get cleared. And the T cells are constantly being activated. They're constantly trying to kill the infected cells, but they're just not able to clear out the infection. And this can go on for weeks, months, even years in the case of some infections that we're probably going to be talking about. And in that case, you need some other regulatory mechanism to turn off the immune system because if you haven't cleared a viral infection after a couple months, you're not clearing it. And so your immune system has to sort of come up with some sort of way to not kill you through inflammation. Right. And it's it's worth noting, too, that this isn't just a viral problem. Obviously, there are pathogens all across humanity that are chronic in nature. Viruses are probably the ones that you would think of. Uh, HIV is a good example of this, although it doesn't take doesn't take advantage of some of the pathways that we're talking about. Obviously, LCMV, which we will talk about, does. And Kate, I hope you know something about LCMV because LCMV is like this wonderful virus that immunologists love to use and then no one knows actually anything about. Can, so, you, can you pronounce the name of LCMV? Are me? you talking to me? Yeah, yeah no, please, I'm talking please to ask, Matt. Please oh. ask Kate. Because it's it's a something it's a something one, cyto cytomegalovirus no 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 nope. it, because <laughs> it's lymphocytic choriomeningitis right yes yeah but go. i don't want to try to say that viruses <laughs> yeah. Woo. yeah please cut out my pronunciation which was <laughs> the wrong I, words it wasn't it wasn't a pronunciation issue right people think uh, i've i've had virologists say lcmv is a herpes virus which it is not it is not even close it's not even a little bit like a herpes virus so yeah i i think i think you're okay okay so so i think at this point we should get into the paper that was long that was a that, i feel like we went through um like a semester of immunology in there was like five minutes <laughs> there was a lot of immunology there yeah no i i think it was a lot i think the the main take-homes here are that you know you you have different kinds of t-cells first of all so we've we've talked actually a lot about antibody responses which i think is important because when people think of vaccines people are often thinking about vac or uh, antibody responses um, but there is such a thing as you know cell-based immunity a huge amount of the field is based on t-cells and it's important to understand, I think, that virus and or viral and bacterial infections can hide within cells, and you know antibodies can't touch them while they're there. Uh, so you need you need some sort of way of looking into individual cells, finding out if they are virally infected, and if they are virally infected, then killing them, or as we mentioned before, I guess allowing the cell to kill itself. So I guess if if anyone's listening and wants to come away with just that, it's that. Uh, CD8 T cells, which we'll be talking a lot about for the paper here, are really responsible for exactly that function, taking a look inside of cells, finding out or assessing, I guess, whether or not they're viral positive. If they are viral positive, then as Kevin mentioned, you release perforin, granzymes, and eventually you wound up with a dead virally infected cell. So on the back of that, uh, we are actually going to introduce the name of the paper that we're actually talking about is uh, Restoring Function in Exhausted CD8 T Cells During Chronic Viral Infection. So this is a paper out of Rafi Ahmed's lab. Actually, some of the other co-authors are members of Harvard's community, Arlene Sharp, John Weary. So there's some big names on this paper, but the first author of the paper is Daniel Barber, and it seems from the author list like he was a grad student, I assume was, because the paper came out a little while back, and you generally graduate pretty quickly when you pump out a nature paper. Yeah, it's usually a fast ticket right out of grad school. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it's as easy as that. Go to grad school, get a nature paper in three years, go away. Um, I'm 
pretty sure many grad students think that that's going to happen for them. I've had plenty of conversations with first year grad students who are like, oh, I'm just going to get this nature paper and I'm going to graduate in two and a half years. Yeah, actually, you know, this rotation, I'm pretty sure, is going to result in a first author nature paper. Yeah, like, and it's I'm It's not even I'm a big deal. Sure. I'll just, you know, wipe up those experiments in a couple months and we'll be done yeah, here. Yeah, totally. And then my PI is going to win a Nobel Prize. I've right. heard that one quite a times too. Have you really? I've never, I've never heard someone there's early of, on. There's a lot of hubris in HIV. There's a lot of hubris. <laughs> <laughs> is, is hubris the right, right word? I feel like the correct word is ignorance. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I think I actually dash. think that I think that right. ignorance is a better word than hubris because hubris means that you know that they're unlikely to win a Nobel Prize, but your <laughs> ego is telling you that damn it, you're gonna get it. At least when you're ignorant, you're like blissfully unaware. You're an incoming grad student. The world is sunny. I remember when the world was sunny. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, not today. No, no, not today. Not today. So in any case, back to the paper here. So Kevin started to allude to this second phase of the immune response that no one really talks about, to be honest with you, all that much, uh, except recently, because it turns out that the second phase is really, really important, and that is the contraction phase. So hopefully by now, if you've been listening to some of our previous podcasts, you'll know that the immune system is an incredibly powerful system. It's terribly dynamic, so it can respond to almost anything. It can actually respond to virtually anything, and it responds to those things in really, really powerful damaging ways that make sure that whatever is trying to live inside you is either held in check or it can't live anymore. Unfortunately, that means that the power of the immune system has the ability to harm you as an organism, not just the bugs that are trying to live inside you. It's sort of this really powerful weapon that if it gets out of control, you get things like autoimmunity, and uh, those that have autoimmunity can tell you that that's not a small thing. You know, your immune system out of control is generally bad. So... This second phase of any sort of reasonable immune response or non-chronic immune response is called contraction, although obviously in this paper they're going to talk about contraction as a part of even a chronic immune response, but contraction is the part of the immune response where the immune system has sallied forth, <laughs> conquered whatever it is that uh, needs to be conquered, and then looks around and says, it was a pretty good job I just did there. And the tissue in the infected area, the tissue looks around and says, yeah, you know what, I think we're clear here. And so everybody all at once decides, well, I think, I think our work here is done. And you enter into this phase where a couple key players in the immune system, in the adaptive immune system, so some of the T cells that were responding, some of the B cells that were responding, responding, say, all right, well, that was a dangerous pathogen. It would probably be best if we remembered what that pathogen was. And so those cells become memory cells. We've talked a tiny bit about them. I'm sure we'll talk about them more later. But this is why you can get vaccinated and your second response is better than your first response was. So you develop some sort of memory pool. But by and large, the vast majority of your immune system is either going to go quiescent. So uh, some of your innate immune system will basically just sort of quiet itself. It's going to be a little bit less phagocytic. Actually, maybe you can speak to this better. Do they do most responders die in the innate immune system? I would I was going to say, I think they mostly die out. Yeah, so so I know that, that anybody that comes in contact with pathogen, usually those guys will die. Uh, that is certainly the case in the adaptive immune system. Unless you are a memory cell, you are not going to travel back into the lymph node. You're not going to go back into circulation. It's Your job is done. The pathogen is cleared. Now it's time to die. So, yeah, maybe what I'm thinking of, I think, is uh, probably cells that were in the vicinity of an infection. Maybe they s saw some of the danger signals but didn't actually encounter the pathogen. But I'm just, I guess I'm trying to give myself a wide berth there because I don't know. I don't know if some of them survive or not. But in any case, it's really important that all of these cells die or at least stop functioning. <laughs> Because if they keep functioning, what ends up happening is you get continued inflammation in the infected tissue, 
that continued inflammation causes tissue damage. The tissue damage causes its own danger signals, and the damaged tissue starts releasing stuff that your immune system wouldn't normally see. I mean, we talked a little bit about thymic development and how you can get expression of really random weird, you know, proteins uh, through through air, but um, usually if a whole bunch of your kidney dies, your immune system doesn't quite know what to do with all of that. So it's really important that your immune system sort of quiets down so you don't get this inflammation, you don't get this damage, you don't get all of the nasty things that we like to associate with auto autoimmunity. And I keep saying autoimmunity. Yeah, I, I keep thinking, like, this is going to get confusing. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it keeps happening, so I apologize for that. But you get all of these things that are problematic that we do associate with autoimmunity. So the immune system has developed a way to sort of recognize that the tissue is no longer infected. Or the tissue, I guess, more importantly, has recognized a way to tell the immune system, yeah, it's all okay, I think we're done. And the immune system obviously has to have the ability to see that. And so this is a receptor ligand interaction, as most interactions occur in the immune system. And so the, the focus of this paper, uh, they talk in the title about exhausted CD8 T cells, what they're really talking about are CD8 T cells that have gone out to the site of infection, been fighting this virus for a long time. The virus is winning. There are still infected cells, but we've gotten to the point where evolutionarily it's dangerous for the CD8 T cells to continue doing what they're supposed to do. So instead of continuing to attack, continuing to make inflammatory responses, all of those sorts of things, the tissue sort of signals the white flag. Uh, it puts up a protein called PDL1. Mm -hmm. And so PDL1 is one of the major molecules that we'll be talking about in this paper. PD1 is what we're talking about when we're talking about the T cell side of things. So CD8 T cells that have been working really hard for a long time to clear virus in a specific tissue, eventually they shut their activation signals down and they upregulate something called PD1. And so if PD1 is expressed on the T cell because it's been working hard for a long time, and if PDL1 is expressed on the tissue because it's infected, if those two things are expressed, then the T cell will take a look at the tissue and say, you know, I still see virally infected cells, but it is dangerous for me to continue on this crusade that I'm on, and so I'm going to shut this down. And so this is something that we call T cell exhaustion. The T cells are literally exhausted. They've been fighting a long fight for a long time, or a hard fight for a long time, and uh, no one wants to continue. So would you say that there, are, that there are two ways that the immune system turns, at least two ways that we've talked about, that the immune system can turn off, specifically CD8? So one would just be the normal resolution of a virus infection, and then the second one would be this exhausted type or does exhausted CD8 cells, is that, the, is that the normal way that CD8s turn off? So usually if there's clearance, if, you, if the virus is no longer there, then you'll stop getting viral peptide expression. You'll stop seeing viral peptide on the outside of these infected cells or non-infected cells. You don't have any infected cells anymore. And so these T cells basically just stop seeing what they're specific for. Mm -hmm. And like any other adaptive immune compartment, if it completely stops seeing what it's specific for, it's just not going to last very long. Mm -hmm. Especially, I imagine, in an activated state where they're producing tons of interferon gamma, you know, IL-12, just things that are highly inflammatory, I suspect that they're, they're pretty highly in tune to whether or not they continue to see antigen on a regular basis. And actually that gets into really what they're showing in this paper. So uh, perhaps you can explain to us a little bit about LCMV, but before you do that, LCMV is a virus and it comes in two flavors. So this is a virus that infects mice and immunologists love this virus. We can use it because there are two major flavors that we use. One is called the Armstrong flavor. Mm -hmm. um, and the Armstrong flavor is an acute virus. It goes in, it replicates really fast, and it is it is highly infectious, but it gets cleared by your immune system pretty quickly, or, or the mouse's immune system. The mouse recognizes that it's infected, clears everything, and then everything goes back to baseline. There's a second flavor of this virus called Clone 13, and Clone 13 is a bit more nefarious in that it's a little more subtle. Uh, it gets into tissue. There is an immune response that occurs, but the immune response is not sufficient to clear the virus. 
So you have virus that just sort of hangs out in tissues, it replicates at really low levels, and you get this thing called T-cell exhaustion. And this is really the basis uh, that this, this paper is focused on. So, But if you have thoughts on uh, what LCMV actually is, I would, I would be really appreciative, because this, this is one of those things that gets thrown around as a tool that immunologists use, but we never really actually focus on what's going on with it. Yeah, so it's a pretty simple virus. It's an RNA virus, so similar to influenza virus and cold viruses like rhinoviruses. It's also an RNA virus, so its genome is encoded in RNA, whereas like humans and like all animals and anything that's moving that you can see has a genome that's encoded in DNA. And so LCMV is an RNA virus. It has two segments to its genome. And it's also in a negative orientation, which means if it's in positive orientation, then it can be directly translated into protein. But because it's negative, it first needs to be transcribed, so copied into the positive orientation, and then it's it can be translated in the in a cell. And so I think the only the only difference between LCMV Armstrong and then the clone thirteen is two amino acid changes and one of them is in the glycoprotein so it might do you know maybe you know this better than i do i think it might have slightly different tropism in a mouse okay i think it's i think the clone 13 is more it uh, attacks like some organs more heavily than the um, Armstrong strain does. Okay. Arm yeah, and tropism, strain. just to clarify that, is just a word we use to, you know, which cells these viruses are going to pick to infect, right? Yeah. So, so I guess the other thing to mention about this virus is that it's a mouse virus, so it infects mice. Right. Though there is some threat to pregnant women in that it can be really damaging to a fetus. So if you're pregnant, you're usually asked not to work with LCMV. Oh, I it's, did not know yeah, that. Yeah. Next time I'm pregnant, I will not <laughs> work with LCMV. Yeah, that's kind of an, its own discussion in itself, how to work yeah. in, as a scientist when you're pregnant. Right. Yeah, actually, I had never thought of that. Yeah. Let's see here. I think that's, I think that's pretty much all that's particularly important for LCMV. Okay. Do you know where, uh, what's the normal route of like how, how do these things travel from mouse to mouse? The chronic virus can be transmitted from mother to fetus. The other virus, uh, let, give me a second. <laughs> let so, me look it up <laughs> in fields. So yeah. So, <laughs> so fun story. Um, and by fun, I mean relevant but not so fun so one of the one of the major differences when you're studying things like flu in mice is that mice cannot cough they don't have that reflex and so whereas humans often transmit viral particles by cough mice mice will not and so i'm always interested in in how mice actually transmit infection oh that's interesting so i mean like a lot of mice transmit infection through feces and pee and just right. like having it in the area and then it dusts up and I'm assuming they inhale it, those sorts of viruses. I mean, yeah. So like LCMV is an arena virus. And so a lot of viruses, a lot of arena viruses, bunya viruses are related virus. A lot of them are transmitted through like feces. So so LCMV is kind of like, I don't know. It's not it's not actually a virus I really think about ever because I don't work on bunya viruses. <laughs> Apparently, there was a 2013 paper that suggests that mice can cough in a very small way that is barely audible. So it could is it be that, a Zoolander that cough. It, <laughs> I I imagine so. In any case, none of this is is really all that important. So I would just like to double down that everything that I said seems to be correct. I've just done a quick Google. So transmission LCMV transmitted through contact with nasal secretions or urine of mice. It's shed by hamsters and mice before they've been weaned, apparently. And among okay. animals that are naturally infected with this virus, the most common route of transmission is in utero. Okay, so that is more than I have ever known about. <laughs> LCMV. But what I have known for a long time is that they do come again in these two flavors, acute and chronic. And so one of the uh, the hallmarks of the chronic infection is that the CD8 T cells just seem to stop working. So you do get a CD8 T cell response. They just don't seem to work anymore. And so this is the first paper that really starts to get at why those CD8 T cells don't work anymore. And I've sort of already stolen the punchline. We're going to be talking a lot about PD-1, PD-2, 
DDL1 here, but at the beginning of this paper, they really just start out and they isolate CD8 T cells. So they take mice that have been infected with the acute form of the virus, the lytic form of the virus, and then they take CD8 T cells from the chronically infected mouse, and they just ask the simple question, do the CD8 T cells still work? And the answer is, uh, yeah, in the, in the acutely infected mouse, the CD8 T cells still work. But if you try to stimulate the CD8 T cells that came from the chronically infected mouse, those T cells don't seem to work anymore. So, you know, you do what any budding immunologist would do, and you uh, run a microarray to see what's different <laughs> between those two CD8 T cell populations. And uh, I don't know that we've described microarrays before. We've talked about RNA a little bit, and we've talked about RNA as sort of... No, we have, actually. We've talked about how RNA can be used as sort of an assessment of what a cell is producing at any one time. What are the tools that it needs at any given moment? So a T cell that is in attack mode will have a different RNA signature than a T cell that's in resting state. So they take a look at the T cells that are responding versus the T cells that aren't responding, and one of the major things that they find that's very different is that they produce this protein called PD-1. And if they take a look at PD-1 expression in CD8 T cell populations, so if you take two naive mice, they've never seen a virus, you infect one with the acute version, you infect one with the chronic version, and you look at the PD-1 expression by the CD8 T cells. Uh, actually, what's interesting to me, and I didn't realize this, is that you do get sort of a transient upregulation of PD-1 in both CD8 T cell populations, which means that either PD-L1 must be upregulated later or they're just resistant to it at the beginning, but you get a, a quick upregulation by both the chronic and acute targeting CD8 T cells, but pretty quickly the PD-1 expression on the acute T cells, the T cells attacking the acute infection, it drops down to baseline, but the PD-1 expression in the chronically infected mouse keeps going up. So these T cells are expressing this inhibitory receptor at increasing levels as the days go on. And so they track up to day 40 and they show that basically these T cells are just sort of stuck with uh, this PD-1 protein on their surface. But of course PD-1 isn't the only signal that would prevent these T cells from attacking. You also need the ligands that would associate with PD-1, right? So you would expect that the tissue that the LCMV is inhabiting is all also expressing its receptor or the ligand for PD-1, and the ligand is PD-L1. It's the ligand of PD-1. That's what the L is for. So they take a look at spleens in the chronically infected mice, and sure enough, as you might expect, the spleens have sort of thrown up the white flag in the chronically infected mice, and they've said, well, we haven't quite cleared it, but it's time for you to stop responding. And that, in conjunction with the CD8 T cells saying, well, I've been at this for a while now, and I'm not really getting anywhere, and so I'm just going to upregulate PD-1, that interaction essentially shuts down the CD8 T cell response. So now you're stuck. You're in a situation where you have have this virus, you know that it's there, the T cells are there, they see the virus, but the T cells are getting signal from the tissue that's basically saying it's time to stop responding. If you keep responding, we're eventually going to hit a dangerous place here, autoimmunity might happen, too much tissue damage might happen, it's best just to keep this thing under wraps. And so I think PDL1 is upregulated by interferon and other molecules that signal that a that a virus or an infection has happened. So mm -hmm. it's pretty common like pretty common cytokines upregulate PDL1. So I think that the PDL1 is just always going to be they don't show it directly, at least not in this first figure. They show the chronically mm -hmm. infected. But I think right. the PDL1 is what goes on first. And so it's always available. But then the PD-1 okay. is what's regulated during and is then upregulated during the chronic infection and when the T cells become exhausted. So that's interesting. So that means that in the acute infection, both the T cells are upregulating PD-1, but they just not must not be responding to it immediately. Oh, no, no. So, every, so everyone upregulates 
PDL one, but right. the, uh, no, but so oh, everyone you mean, also, so the yeah, transient, so the panel C activation. here, yeah, yeah, there does seem to be some upregulation of PD one, so it, yeah. it could just be that the activation signals are so strong in this case by mm -hmm. day six mm -hmm. that the T cells are saying, I don't care if there's PDL one in the environment, I'm just gonna go anyway, mm -hmm. but then eventually they get tired of that, and so it backs off, and then all of a sudden you have an, an inactivated, exhausted T cell. Mm -hmm. So when you say that PD-1 is being upregulated, you're looking at figure 1C? and the, 1C. Is that what you're going off of? Yeah, so okay. day day 6, day you've six. got a transient increase in the yeah. in the acute response. Yep. Yeah, and then it goes back down. Right. So the, the obvious next move here is to try to block this. So you've got these T cells. They're sitting around. They're seeing a viral infection. It's not like they're not specific. So they've got all of the tools to potentially respond, but they've got this inhibitory pathway that's working. The tissue's basically just telling them to stop, and they are tired. But what happens if you block that pathway? What happens if you prevent PD-1 from binding to PD-L1, and all of a sudden you kick those T cells back on? And there's a really simple answer, actually, but uh, it's pretty cool and that this is really the first paper that I've seen that shows it decisively is that it resolves, actually. The infection starts to resolve a little bit. So if you block the pd one pathway just using an antibody against pd one so this antibody binds to pd one and it prevents pd one from binding to PD-1 on the T-cell. So if you, if you block that inhibitory signal, all of a sudden you get increased numbers of CD8 T-cells at the site, which means that your T-cells are dis your T cells at the site are dividing. So this is a sign of activation and response. All of a sudden your viral titers go way down, so you can't find virus basically in the spleen or the liver or the lung. Well, maybe a little bit in the lung. I am interested because they did not see viral decrease in the kidney so much. I mean, obviously there's a significant difference there, but I'm interested in why there's not a complete difference the way that other tissues are. This is what I was talking about, the tropism. I think that's the main site of viral replication. Oh yeah, okay. So so maybe there's a tropism issue there that they're battling. But at least in the spleen and the liver, CD8 T cells have reactivated. And all of a sudden, whereas before they were just sitting around seeing these virally infected cells, and saying, eh, but I'm really tired. <laughs> Now they're super activated because we've we've blocked the inhibitory pathway. And you can take these cells and you can stimulate them with any number of peptides that load into MHC that look like the virus. And if you block the PDL1 pathway, you get much, much better responses. It, it seems like these T cells are capable of reactivating. They are not terminally exhausted. So you can sort of poke them a little bit. And yeah. when you poke them, they come back and they kill the virus. So right? They kill the virus infected cells. Yeah. So I think I find that the most surprising, I think, is that if you block them, that they still are functional because... Yeah, isn't that interesting? You would think, and it might just be a quirk of the actual virus that they're using, in that maybe if it were a different virus, the cells wouldn't be as functional, but you block PDL1 and they still make they make gamma in response mm -hmm. to viral peptides. It seems to be specific to the virus. They make TNF. That is interesting. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually a really interesting topic that immunologists love to fight about, and that's the topic of energy. So energy is this weird sort of purge of cell activation states. For example, B cells. You want to make sure that you don't have self-reactive B cells. So if a B cell is growing up in the bone marrow and it realizes that it's responding to something that exists in the organism that it's growing up in, it does a couple things. It can receptor edit, it can make a new B cell receptor, all of those things. It can also become anergic. And anergic is a really funny place because it means that the B cell is functionally rendered non-responsive. But that doesn't make any sense evolutionarily. We've already talked about how autoimmunity is a really nasty thing. It can potentially lead to a lot of tissue damage, all of those things. When the immune system is so tightly controlled in terms of who lives and who dies, why would you ever allow a B cell that may or may not be autoreactive to be anergic rather than just kill itself outright. And, you know, people make arguments in, in different directions, but I would argue, I guess, and this is totally opinion at this point, I would argue that in every case of energy, in every case where a B cell or a T cell decides, well, you know, I might be dangerous, but, you know, I, I guess I'll 
stick around. I think that there's probably an evolutionary reason for those cells to stick around, and I imagine that it's for cases like this. Thoughts? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So cases where they would get some sort of reactivation signal? I thought they couldn't reactivate. So this is this is sort of the dogma, but I guess I would argue that unless there's something that they're providing to the immune system at in an energic state, which it very well could be, it could be that your immune system is designed so that, you know, a certain percentage of B cells must be energic and that allows for the function of the rest of the immune system. That could very well be. I I am more likely to believe that there is a reactivation protocol in many of these cases, but we just don't know why that is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But again, totally, totally out there at that point. So from an innate, from an an innate immunology perspective, so B cells are antigen presenting cells and they have all sorts of innate react or innate receptors. And I wonder, like my guess would be maybe they serve as some sort of, as a cell to detect when an infection Mm. is actually there. That is a super interesting idea, actually. So you're saying that you could have a B cell that recognizes a self protein, internalizes it, and then acts as an APC to prevent other B cells from potentially becoming active to that thing? Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Someone do that experiment out there. Someone do that experiment. I think that's a really interesting experiment. I think Klaus Ryeski has all the mice for that. I can think of like 14 genetic models that could be used. That makes me think maybe someone has done it and it wasn't very interesting. (laughs) It could very well be. It could also be that the answer is a little more complicated than we're giving it credit for. Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) But in any case, it seems like these previously activated CD8 T cells are capable of becoming reactivated. And so, so the question really becomes... How robust is the reactivation? Are, are CD8 T cells themselves capable of reactivating? Or by inhibiting PD1, PDL1, are you really just allowing the immune system sort of as a whole to reset, maybe? And so what they do to test this idea is they, uh, they create, and I really, I really enjoyed this, they created helpless CD8 <laughs> T cells. So CD4 T cells, we haven't talked a lot about them, but they're actually a really critical mediator of a lot of adaptive immune response. So they will help B cells become active and produce antibodies. They will help macrophages become highly phagocytic and really degradative by increasing reactive oxygen species production. They will also help CD8 T cells perform their effector function. And so in any case, when you have some sort of CD8 T cell response, You also have a CD4 T cell response that's happening sort of in tandem off to the side, although we're not talking about it much today. But if you eliminate the CD4 T cell response, inevitably the CD8 T cell response becomes worse. And that's because the CD8 T cells do rely, or at some level, on CD4 T cell responses. So in the case of a chronic infection or a a viral infection where you do need a CD8 T cell response, if you eliminate the CD4s, that CD8 T cell response becomes worse. And so in this situation, they intentionally eliminate the CD4 T cells. And why do they do that? They really want to isolate the CD8 T cell response. If they block pd one and the CD4 T cells aren't there anymore, they can't provide any help, i.e. The, uh, the helpless CD8 T cell, and you still release the phenotype. So the CD8 T cells go back to normal despite not having any CD4 T cells around, then you can be really sure that these CD8 T cells are directly responding to this PD1, PDL1 blockade, and that the inhibition of the PDL1 signaling is actually causing the CD8 T cells to reactivate. And that's exactly what they see. This is one of those figures, I think, where you've already shown everybody all of the methods that you're using. You're just saying, and look, it works in this system too, right? We don't even need CD4 T cells. And despite the absence of CD4 T cells, we still get reactive activation of CD8 T cells. That means it's cell intrinsic. And those CD8 T cells are capable of doing all the things that we showed you in the first two figures. We get proliferation, we get reduction in viral loads. So all of the things that we had previously seen in the presence of CD4 T cells, we also see in the absence. So so the only thing that I don't like about this particular figure, and maybe this is just from a reading of it, is 
Okay, so the purpose of CD4 cells is not to downregulate PD1, correct? Correct. So it kind of like implies this model that like that's what a CD4 cell is doing. I mean, I guess it right. is under the context of a chronic viral infection. But do you think yeah. if you were, I would be surprised if you didn't see similar results from just trying to replicate CD4 help, like just providing like IL-2, would you then get higher functionality proliferation of your CD8s in the absence of CD4s? Yeah, so I wouldn't be so worried about IL-2, I guess, in this scenario. There's mm -hmm. a couple other uh, stimulation pathways that I'd be more concerned with uh, that I, I don't think it's... It's like one Good of two get pathways into now. that I know of. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, there there aren't that many, actually. Yeah. It's, it's pretty slim. But what I would be concerned about when I was doing these experiments, and I suspect what they were concerned about, is that if CD4 T cells are really controlling the site of infection, as we often think about them doing. So mm -hmm. um, I think of dendritic cells as the generals. Mm -hmm. I think of them as the people that go to lymph nodes, and they take a look at your entire immune system, and they they say, you, you, and you, here's what's wrong, here's how I need it fixed, here's where it is, go do it, mm -hmm. right? So the dendritic cells really are calling the shots from a grand scheme level. They're telling the immune system what to do eventually for the entirety of the infection. CD4 T cells are a little bit closer to the action. Um, they're sort of like commanders that are on the ground, right? So you'll get a CD4 T cell that goes into the site of infection and looks around and says, all right, the dendritic cell told me that I need to activate macrophages. I need to help CD8 T cells do their job. I need to, you know, do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And so the CD4 T cell starts to produce all of these signals that allow all of those immediate players to sort of perform their effector functions. Mm -hmm. What I would be concerned about in this scenario is that the PD1, PDL1 system was acting on CD4 T cells. Mm -hmm. And so what was really happening was the spleen of the LCV infected mouse was upregulating PDL1. Mm -hmm. And that was inhibiting the CD4 T cell's ability to do its job. And the CD4 T cell then wasn't able to push the CD8 T cell to do enough killing. And so I think what they were really doing here was to try to eliminate the possibility that the CD8 T cell response was sort of an aberration off to the side, and really it was the CD4s that were in control. Mm -hmm. So that's my that's my thought, and hopefully uh, hopefully someone from the paper will listen to this at some point and then email us and uh, <laughs> let us know if that was the actual thing. But that that is what I would be concerned about. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, no, no. I I, no. I I agree. I agree. No, I agree. I. I I really liked this paper when I first read it in immunology, the first year classes. But I, the thing about the, it, this paper, it, it just everything seems like so simple and straightforward, which I think is a, <laughs> is a wonderful strength of the paper to distill it down to just a couple of molecules. But then it makes me very suspicious at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, hopefully we'll talk about it a little bit at the end. But it's actually amazing. There are a couple. There are only a couple pathways that we know of like this, mm -hmm. and it turns out that. That those pathways have profound control over the way the immune system contracts or is regulated or all those things. And that has effects not only in infectious disease, as we're talking about now, but also tumor immunity. So maybe we'll save that save that to the end as the, uh, yeah. the teaser, because there are some very obvious leaping off points from this kind of study mm -hmm. as far as what you can do in controlling these pathways. Uh, so I really hope that in future episodes, we'll actually be able to tackle this a little bit more. But back in the, the study that we've been discussing, I think it probably, even though the CD4 T cell ablation started to get at this idea that it was CD8 T cells that were important in this pathway, you really have to start to wonder, is it actually CD8 T cells that are responsible for this? Like CD4s were probably the most likely target, but you really do want to confirm that the CD8 T cells themselves were the ones that were doing the responding once you lifted the PD-1, PD-L1 blockade. And so how do you do this? One of the ways that you can do this is using something that we've talked about before, which is that you can take cells in the immune system and you can pull them from one animal and you can transfer them to a different animal without too much trouble 
so long as the genetic background is the same. What you can do is you can take two chronically infected mice, so presumably both mice have CD8 T cells, both mice have CD8 T cells that are exhausted. You can pull the T cells or all of the immune cells from one mouse, and now I've got them in a tube, and I label them with something. So literally a, a green fluorescent protein. So my cells in a tube, which include exhausted CD8 T cells, now they're green, which it's means actually, that if uh, I... It's actually a dye. So it's like food coloring almost. Yeah. And so these cells take up the dye, and so now they're green, and I can see them being green, and I can now inject them into another mouse that is chronically infected. And what have I done? I really haven't done actually all that much. I've just taken CD8 T cells, or I've taken immune cells that are exhausted from one mouse and put them into another mouse that also has T cells that are exhausted, right? I haven't done much, except now I have been able to dye some of those cells with green. So I can look at them later. <laughs> <laughs> basically, what you find, uh, without getting into more of the details of how these experiments are done, basically what you find is that those T cells that you transfer, that you can now track with that green fluorescent protein, once you release the PD-1, PD-L1 blockade by introducing the anti-PD-1 blo uh, blocking antibody, those green T cells all of a sudden stop being sad and exhausted. <laughs> And they start being happy, and they produce all of the cytokines that we think that they should be producing, and they start proliferating the way that T cells should proliferate when you have an active viral infection. So really, they're just confirming in figure four that it's the CD8 T cells that are doing the responding. It's the CD8 T cells that are important in this, and it's the CD8 T cells that are primarily responding to this PD-1, pd one interaction. So then we get to my favorite part of any nature paper, or most, most immunology nature papers. Are you going to talk about 4C? Because I think that part was an interesting point, or did you? 4C. Oh, no, go for it. So, well, I guess I was more asking if I'm reading this right. Mm. Okay, so in 4C... I thought you were saying 4C, like F-O-R-S-E-E, -E, and I was like, no, I don't know what that is. <laughs> so they take the chronically infected mouse, and they sort for the CD8 cells, and then look if they express PD-1 or if they don't. And then yep. they put those into a very similar mouse that's also chronically infected and then look right. for the antigen specific T cells. And so after treatment with the PDL1 blockade. After treatment with PDL1 blockade. So right. the exhausted T cells are the only ones that or the the ones that go unexhausted are the only ones that are antigen specific is that the idea to show that yeah. so i think what they were worried about here is that it could be that you administer the pd1 pdl1 blockade mm -hmm. and then a new a batch new response of okay. t cells yes. all of a sudden comes in and that would sort of invalidate all of their findings it means that really what's happening is not that the cd cd8 t cells you know sort of become reactive okay it's instead that a new a new generation of t-cells comes up and they ignore these signals and they respond to the virus okay. Okay. and because because you've sort of taken a snapshot of the t-cell population and mm -hmm. put it into another mouse you can't get any new t-cells that are green yeah but what they do show is that the green t-cells do become reactivated so previously exhausted t-cells do get reactivated still yes okay great that makes figure 4c my favorite figure in this whole nice <laughs> success <laughs> success in audio immunity because uh, figure five is just more of a and now here are more questions figure five is glorious <laughs> it's glorious actually so this figure five i i have to figure. say i often i often hate figure five in nature because me too usually it's, this, it's always this experiment well it's it's always this experiment and it's because nature or it's actually not just nature i can't just you know no, it's throw this out too. at nature There's but it's yeah all of these papers guys that in this way many science papers in this way yeah now we have so everyone if, on bated breath wondering what is this right exactly no it's, it's crazy right no so if you want to make a really good immunology paper high impact uh, like super exciting paper there is one experiment you must do absolutely. and what you what you must do is you must show that in some way your finding can make a mouse just die die <laughs> 
The last figure is to kill a mouse. Exactly. If you can make your mouse die under the situation that you've laid out for the rest of the paper, you're going to bump your impact by at least one journal level, one I think. Tier. Yeah, I, yep. agree. I there's, agree. There's there's a there's a tier. And so this is figure 5. But figure 5 I actually like in this paper. It makes more sense. And it's because it's in it's interesting. Well, and it, it like you said it it asks a new question at the end of it which I actually think is incredibly interesting. So if you take a mouse that cannot make PDL1, so the spleen can never raise the white flag, so you get this high on, like full on CD8 T cell, like everybody's responding, and then you give it the acute virus. As you might expect, the immune system responds, it responds fast, it responds efficiently, the virus is cleared. And by probably actually the mechanism that we were talking about earlier, the CD8 T cells just don't see the virus anymore. The CD8 T cells shut themselves down. Most of them die. A memory pool is generated, probably normal, right? But then if you take the same mice, again, can't upregulate PDL1, the tissue can't tell the immune system, stop responding in the chronic infection. You might think, based on the rest of the findings of this paper, that what you would get is viral clearance. So the CD8 T cells never get the signal to stop, and so they keep attacking, and so the virus eventually gets cleared, and that is not what happens. <laughs> and that is what makes, for me, Figure 5 glorious. They still killed the mouse, <laughs> but they killed the mouse in a different mechanism than the rest of the paper lays out. Basically, what they find is that if you don't have PDL1, basically, if you don't have the breaks on the immune system in the chronic infection, not only will the chronic infection stay chronic, but the ensuing immune response, which is now uncontrolled because you don't have PDL1, because the T cells can't see it and the T cells won't stop responding, that ensuing immune response will kill the mouse and it will kill it quickly. We're talking six, seven days. You get a completely uncontrolled systemic immune response and the mouse will die, which I find fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. So it it, it dies so much faster, which do you think this would support a hypothesis that PDL1 and PD1 have roles early in infection? Or do you think this mouse has a developmental Mm. issue? Yeah. So this is an interesting question because we've already seen all the way through this paper that if you allow a mouse to become chronically infected and then the CD8 T cells become exhausted, and then you release that exhaustion with a PD-1, PD-L1 blockade. Mm-hmm. This is like 14 the days symptoms, later. The symptoms resolve. Yeah, yeah, a long time. But if you never have that PD-L1 signal to begin with, the mouse dies. Yeah. Right? So what that would suggest is that that PD-1, PD-L1 blockade, which maybe we thought through this paper was detrimental to the mouse, actually was saving its life. <laughs> Right, which, it, which it doesn't shut... make sense given the no, whole evolution idea. <laughs> right, it was saving its life in that you know these breaks that the immune system incorporates as it's talking to the outside peripheral tissue. Those breaks are really, really important. They're there for a reason, and they probably get turned on in a time frame that is extremely evolutionarily selected for, right? If you have uncontrolled activation of the adaptive immune system for X amount of time, it becomes really detrimental and eventually the mouse dies. That's what we're seeing in figure five. And so you do need all of these breaks. These systems are there for a very powerful and important reason. But what we can do is we can manipulate that just a little bit. We can wait a little bit longer. We can allow the situation to sort of stabilize a little bit. But those T cells are still there. The infected tissue is still there. And then what happens if we sort of take everything off, right? We take the mm-hmm. breaks off for a short amount of time. And all of a sudden, those T cells become active. Then we know that those T cells will become reactivated. And for at least the short amount of time that we're inhibiting that pathway, they will be able to control better. So why don't we give people PDL one blockade when uh. they have a chronically infected like why don't we give HIV patients PDL one blockade? So I think HIV is a is a slightly different scenario where yeah. to my knowledge, PD one, PDL one is not involved in the scenario or in not involved in the infection. Really? Uh, in in my understanding, I don't know that it's yeah. I'm not I'm not aware that PD one PDL one is one of the ways that HIV hides, but it could be. Tell me I'm wrong. Oh, I guess I I more meant like um. So I think there is an exhausted T cell phenotype with 
with HIV infection. I'm not sure that it's something that the virus is upregulating or the virus is trying to use to escape. Right. But there is, there's your CD8 like responses become like all sorts of scrambled. So, yeah, so that's so more. So you're asking about potential applications of yeah. PD1, PDL1 blockade. And so what I would mention in this paper is. You know what a really good figure five would have been? PD-1 blockade administration. The mouse gets better and then you remove PD-1, pd one blockade mm-hmm. and the mouse does not have LCMV anymore. Yeah. So they Tell never... me that they didn't do that experiment over the course of this study. They of course did that experiment. Of course and they the did. And the answer is if you look back way back at figure two, there's still virus in the kidney. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. And so I think in the case of at least chronic LCMV infection. Uh, clearly, PD-1, pd one blockade is effective. It knocks down T-cell responses, but it probably doesn't completely clear the infection. Yeah. That being said, and this is something I really want to get into and I hope we can get into in future episodes, but PD-1, pd one and this, the discovery of this pathway and a related pathway, actually, the CTLA-4 pathway, those two things are, I think, to date in my mind the biggest contribution that immunologists have been able to give to human health Mm -hmm. and that's a big statement to make but i say it because and it's a very new field it's just coming out but there is a really solid amount of data out there now that you can start to manipulate the way that the immune system breaks work Mm -hmm. and if you do that you can actually do a whole lot with something called tumor immunology yes And so tumors are not stupid. They are stupid, but they come across mutations where you can imagine a tumor doesn't want a CD8 T cell attacking it, right? So the tumor is going to, of course, upregulate PDL1. Yeah. Like, why would it not? The T cell is going to come to the tumor and be like, oh, well, I guess my work here is done. This sucks. And it's just going to sit there. And it turns out your immune system is so much better at recognizing that you have a tumor than you are. And so you have these T cells. They're sitting there. They're ready to attack, but they can't because the tumor is sort of usurping all of these turned down signals. And it Mm -hmm. also uses CTLA-4 and it also uses something else that I won't get into today. But we are starting to get a handle on this and we are starting to be able to use some of these blockades to take the breaks off the immune system for a short amount of time and that is leading to some outcomes that we probably honestly never thought possible as far as tumor recognition and destruction Mm -hmm. so i don't know maybe that's a maybe that's a good place to to leave it we'll uh we'll have a bit of a leader hopefully into some cancer immunology but as far as today is concerned uh, there are breaks on the immune system and you know chronic viral infections lead to t-cell exhaustion and and we can play with that yeah i think that's a great summary (laughs) cool cool This has been Autoimmunity, Episode 7 from immunity.org. You can find us, as always, on iTunes. You can search for Audio Immunity. That's A-U-D-I-O-M-M-U-N-I-T-Y. We are on Google+, Plus, although we're a little delinquent on the social media front at the moment. We're also on Facebook, so uh, link in, and hopefully we'll have some updates for you very shortly. But you can find all of those links on our website at immunity.org. That's E-M-M-U-N-I-T-Y dot O-R-G. As always, we're supported in part by Harvard Medical school and our music was composed by kevin's wonderful fiance rachel reinick so thanks for listening and hopefully we'll see you next time